Thank you, sir. Call again. Goodbye. The hey, Art's got a pretty busy station here. Yes. I wish you had a station like this. I've got a Chevron station. I still wish you had a busy one. Oh. Good evening, sir. Can I help you? I'm looking for Art Williams. Oh, he left early today. Big bowling match tonight. Yeah, I know. I came up from River Edge to help wall up his team. Oh, then you're with the stars. Well, I wish you luck, but Art's team's pretty good. Say, why don't you give him a ring? His number is Hillview 2067. The phone's in the office. Thanks. Len, say hello to Edna. Tell her to be sure and come to the game tonight. Go ahead with dinner, Edna. I'll take it. Oh, thanks, dear. Hey, Dad, if that's Eddie, tell him I'll be ready to go in 15 minutes. And if it's Bill? Well, you can tell him I've already gone. <laughs> yeah? Hello, Art. Lynn. Say, this is the nicest surprise I've had in a long time, Len. Where are you? At your station. Irene drove up with me. She's looking forward to seeing Edna and you at the bowling match. Wonderful. Wait a minute, Len. Edna, it's Len Hanlon. He's on the River Edge bowling team, and Irene is with him. Oh, well, tell him how to get out here. I'm sure they haven't had dinner yet. Len, Edna wants you and Irene to come and take potluck with us. Oh, thank you, Art, but we know can do. That's a strict order from Irene. Just tell me where there's a good eating place in this bird. We'll grab a bite and see you later. Oh, I wish they'd come. They wouldn't be any trouble. All right, Len, if that's the way you want it. There's one good place I can recommend. It's not a cafe, no neon signs, just a house, like a tea room. But the lady that runs it's a terrific cook. We eat there a lot. I'm sure you'd like it. Sounds good, Art. Where is it? Well, you drive six blocks east on Broad, turn left on Sycamore, and it's the second house in the third block on the right side. Well, that's our house. It is? <laughs> okay, Art. Thanks a lot. See you at the bowling alley. Is this the... This is it. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Len, Irene, it's good to see you. Something smells kind of fishy here. Must be the broiled halibut Edna's fixing for you. Hard Williams, you're an old humbug. <laughs> and speaking of fish, I swallowed the bait, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> <laughs> Irene, Len, say this is wonderful. It's terrible barging in on you like this. Well, Len wanted the best eating place in town, and this is it. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't think of you going anyplace else. Well, at least let me help you with the dinner, Edna. I think it's almost ready. Come on, let's go and see. Let me have your hat. Make yourself at home. Got a nice place here, Art. Well, that's what we work for, Len. A bit of comfort and pleasure out of life. Well, I can see you're getting it. No thanks. How do you do it? You know, gas, oil, tires, etc., etc. Hey, Dad, can I borrow the new car tonight? I'm going to Marge's for dinner. Oh, hello, Mr. Hamlin. Well, how are you, Bird? My, you really have grown up. Well, you know I'm a senior now, Mr. Hamlin. Well, good boy. I suggest you try to talk your mother out of the car. I bought it for her. Thanks, Dad. I think I can do it. <laughs> Say, um, Ruth, is she still at the university? She's home for the holidays. You'll see her. The kids are going to a dance tonight. Mom said it was OK. Goodbye, Mr. Hamlin. Have a good time, Bird. Thanks. So long, Dad. So long, son. Ah, he's a fine boy. Yeah, he'll be starting at the university this fall. He's all hepped up about it. I don't get it. We're in the same business. Sell the same kind of gas and oil, the same tires and batteries and everything else. I can't afford to send my kids to college. <laughs> I can't even afford a new car. How do you do it? Well, it's a long story, Len. I'll tell you about it later. But let's forget business. You're in town to have some fun. Yeah, I'd still like to know how you do it. Well, right now, you'd better concentrate on bowling. We're out to give your team a drubbing. You two are hungry. Dinner's on the table. Come on, Len. You'll need your strength tonight. <laughs> You're just lucky, that's all. Look out for a split. <laughs> You're coming up, Oscar. Here we go. I don't know why they get so excited about this silly game. 
They knock themselves out throwing those heavy balls or those little sticks of wood. And I can't imagine why they don't hit them all. They're all down there covering the whole place. Oscar's told me nothing about it, even bowls in his sleep. Bubbles, darling. A little less on the yak-yak when I bowl. I gotta concentrate. <laughs> Our husband's funny. Oh, well, he's the only one I've got. That's the third split. You should have control. See what you did? I would have gotten them all. I've been admiring your coat, Edna. Oh, thanks. Go ahead. Quite a time finding just what I wanted, but finally I saw this one day down at Mason's. It was very reasonable. I think it looks stunning. Doesn't it, Len? Hmm? Edna's new coat. It's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. mine a chocolate milkshake. What will it be, please? Two Cokes and a chocolate milk. Better make it three Cokes. <laughs> three Cokes. Hey, she reminded me of a story. It goes like this. Do you know why girls wear sweaters? I can think of a couple of reasons. But the important reason. All right, I'll be the stooge. Why do girls wear sweaters? Here you are, sir. Oscar! Coming, Bubbles. Position, Art, having you put us up for the night. Well, the girls arranged it. Nothing we could do about it. Irene and I decided you shouldn't drive nearly a hundred miles this time of night. You can phone and have your part-time man put on the first thing in the morning. The station can get along without you for one day. And there's that long story you wanted to hear. Oh, I wasn't really figuring on leaving until I heard it. <laughs> Edna, would you mind very much making a pot of coffee? Len and I have a lot of gabbing to do. All right, but I don't know how you can sleep after coffee at this hour. The idea is I want to keep Len awake. <laughs> That'll take a lot of coffee. I'll help you, Edna. <laughs> Still curious? Well, I'd sure like to know how you do it. Thanks. Well, Len? I found out it was simple to make a good thing out of my Chevron station after I discovered one important fact. I had to sell myself to the customer. And that's the Alpha and Omega. That's college stuff. I learned it from Ruth. Hmm. Well, what does that mean in our language? The beginning and the end. Oh. And that's just about what selling yourself to the customer means in our business. Everything you get to do on the customer's car stems from that. Where you begin doing the job is right at the pumps. That's the sales room of a gas station. Now, Len, I'm not going to try to tell you anything new. You know the business. But for myself, I worked out a little sales philosophy. Maybe it's not very original, but it gets results. I don't see how you can work out any special kind of sales routine in a gas station. People just drive in for gas and oil. Sometimes just for water and air, and then they drive away. Now, that gets right down to the first point I worked out. The customer doesn't just want gas and oil and air and water. He'd like it better if all the things his car needed were taken care of. Then he wouldn't have to worry about the car at all. And that's about the most wonderful thing a car owner can hope for, but rarely gets. That's way out of line with pumping gas and selling oil. Not as far out as you think. I found that out. Goes back to my first point. If you take good care of your customer's car, keeping it running in good shape, you've built up confidence, sold yourself and one a steady customer. Glenn, there's only one secret in our business. Steady customers. Enough of them. It's as simple as that. Well, here's enough coffee to keep you both awake. But don't stay up all night. Don't worry, I have to open up tomorrow morning. Well, good night. Good night, good night honey. Good night, Len. Good night. Oh, Arthur, don't forget to leave the light on for the children. I won't forget, dear. Good night. Now, let's see, you take cream and sugar? No, black. That's mine, too. There we are. 
Well, now, let's see. Where was I? Well, you were right in the middle of building up a heap of new customers. So I was. And you can put a slide rule on that job, too. Tell me, Len, what are the things a customer likes to get? Good products, friendly service, I guess. Good products, certainly. But that's never a problem with Chevron Station. Friendly service, naturally. But there's two other important points, Len. Getting the customer's confidence and letting him know you appreciate his business. And I figure the best place to do that is at the pump block. That sounds like pretty good sales theory. Theory, maybe. But it isn't worth a damn unless you can put it to work for you. And I decided I would. Now, take the case of one of my customers who came in today. If you'll release the hood, Mr. Evans, I'll see if the oil and water are at safe level. Oh, not today. I think they're okay. It'll only take a moment, then you'll be safe. You've got a broken oil line here. What? What well, can you beat that? And your oil is dangerously low. Can you replace that oil line? Yes, we have one to fit your car. I'll appreciate you putting one on. And fill it with oil, too. Say, I'm glad you insisted on looking under the hood. I might have burned out a bearing. Mm -hmm. So you see, Len, getting under that hood not only made me an extra profit, but it gave me an opportunity to do a service that Mr. Evans really appreciated. That's what I mean about building confidence. Yeah, but you don't always run into broken oil lines. That's right, Len. But you must remember that every customer that comes into your station is a prospect for the sale of some extra service or product. If they come in for gasoline. You'd be surprised how many people come into my station just to use the restroom. I know what you mean, Len. But even they can be prospects. I had one this afternoon. Yeah, that's very kind of you. It was pretty dirty. It'll be a little safer driving this way. What kind of a station is this? It's a Chevron station. We're always glad to be of service. Speaking of uh, service, do you mind if I use your phone? Not at all. It's in the office. Thanks. Uh, while I'm phoning, you might check my tires, if you will. I'll be glad to. Mind if I drive your car over to the pumps? I guess that's where I should have stopped in the first place. Okay, and put in some gas. Shall I fill your tank? Sure. With your best gas. So you see, Lil, even that little service paid off. I sold him almost a full tank of gas and some oil. Yeah, I can see where I can do a lot more about selling gas and also getting under the hood. Shall I fill the tank? <laughs> that isn't any harder to say than, how are you, can I help you, or some of the other things we say to customers. And those are the wrong things. Shall I fill the tank? That's my watchword. Of course, if a customer asks for five or ten, that's what he gets. If he's not a regular, we ask him if he'd like Supreme or Chevron. Otherwise, we simply mention the brand we know he takes regularly. I can see how that might work at the pumps. I can tell you it does. And we all sell oil when it's needed. But what else does the car need? It's up to us to find out and make a sale. On many cars, there are a number of things needed. Maybe the customer can't go for all of them at one time. So I sell the most important need first. Lots of people squawk about buying anything but gas and oil. That gets right back to confidence. For instance, I sell an oil change when it's needed. Never by high pressure, but whenever it's necessary. I get a lot of squawks about changing oil on a do. Yeah, I know, we all get that. I'll tell you how I handle that later. The next item on my sales list is lubrication. That's where I really get under the hood. Having a car in my lube room for a period of time gives me an opportunity to check it thoroughly for other services needed. Those extra sales are good business for me on two counts. I'm making a profit, and I'm sending the car out in good shape. Now, if I do a good job, I make a steady customer. And because he has confidence in me, I can sell him the things the car needs. And I could do with some of that extra business. Those extra sales, the 5,000 mile jobs, the tires, the batteries, the accessories, that make me the extra profit. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Sounds too simple. Oh, I know all those things, but I just don't seem to be able to make them pay off. I'd like to see how they work for you. Good. 
You'll be here tomorrow. You want to visit a gas station on your day off? I sure do. It's the date. I'll wake you early enough so you can phone your assistant to have the part-time man put on. Oh, say, I meant to mention it. That bowling team of yours, that's a swell ad. Good business. It's a lot of fun, too. <laughs> Especially clipping the stars. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you to your room, Len. Think of it like that bowling match last night. Strikes, spares, splits, and misses. If you miss in giving a customer service, nobody's fault but your own. If you fail to give satisfactory service, there will be a split, you and the customer. If you're just doing a spare business, you'll get by. But when you make a strike, you're getting all there is. There's no argument. Oh, excuse me, Len. Good morning, Mrs. Conway. How's the youngster? Got over the spells, back to school. Good. Shall I fill the tank? Yes, it fills up with regular. Fill it up with seven. Good morning, Mrs. Conway. Good morning, Harry. something that may interest you, Mrs. Conway. Oil is at the safe level, Mrs. Conway. Do you cause any good? My wife uses them all the time. I'll try this one. I didn't notice you going after a loop job. No, I didn't. I looked at the speedometer and checked the underhood record. We watch them closely. Here, I'll show you. Here's the record for Mrs. Conway's car. You'll see she had a loop job two weeks ago. I check the file daily and send out cards when service is due. That usually brings in my regulars. If it doesn't, I send another card. And also remind them when they come in for gas. It remains a prospect until the job is done. It's a lot of work. Sure, it's work, but it gets me results. These records help me to keep up to date on every one of my customers' cars. And you'd be surprised how these car records impress them. They need me out there. Look over the card, Len, and see what one car means to the station in dollars and cents. It'll be 285, Mr. Dove. How does it look? Well, it looks fine. Do you like to use an island cash box? Well, it saves me plenty of steps and the customer's time, and that makes it good as far as I'm concerned. Did you make anything out of the card? Yeah, the way I figure it, this car brought you about $75 last year for oil, lube, tires, and a battery. That's right. And when you figure accessory business and other labor, each customer means close to $100. That's profitable business, and that's in addition to the gas I sell. But I guess you keep about the same kind of records. No, I don't. I don't follow up lube jobs like you do. I do some mailing. I got stuck with a batch of cards. Well, I do quite a bit of other mailing, too. I also pass out items like this desk calendar. Some salesman sold me a whole mess of birthday cards. I've been sending them out to customers whose birthdays I know. Say, you've got something in birthday cards. That sounds like a good idea for boosting goodwill. Oh, so I can teach you a thing or two, huh? I'm always willing to learn, Len. You just handed me something good, and I'll use it. See, I've been watching you fellas work at the gas pumps. Well, we've got it set up for a two-man job on a single car or for a one-man job with a second car coming up to the pumps. 
That's one place we can do with a good routine. I've got one. The number one man handles the greeting, the gas, under the hood, payment, and goodbye. While the number two man takes care of the windows and the tires. If the second car drives in, the number two man leaves the first car, gives a sign as to where he's left off, and takes the number one job on the second car. Seems to work for you, Art. When one of us is alone at the pumps and another car drives in, we greet the newcomer and tell him we'll be with him in a moment. They never mind waiting if you give them a little attention. Oh, Mr. Goodwin came in. I want to see him. Come along, Len. There's a point coming up about giving service to a customer. It's all ready for you, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, that's fine. I see you cleaned out the inside of the car, too. That's part of our job. Well, thanks, sir. Well, what's the damage? 770. We made a note of something that needs attention. Your grease seals need replacing. Well, is that serious? If it isn't repaired, you could wind up needing your brakes relined. Well, thanks, Art. I appreciate you telling me. Uh, can you take care of the new grease seals? No, I'm sorry, we can't. I suggest you take the car to your mechanic. Oh, I certainly will. We're planning a long trip in the next few days. Well, we figure it's our job to see that your car is safe to drive. Well, thank you, Art. I'll have your change right away. You see what I mean about confidence? Do you think Mr. Goodwin will take his car anywhere else for service? No. No, I guess you can count on him as a steady customer. We make a practice of giving a lot of service that makes us valuable to the customer. We tighten body bolts and bumpers and things like that, and we tell the customer. That helps to build up confidence in our service. And if the car needs mechanical work, we tell that to the customer. It assures him that we're interested in his car. He likes that, and brings him back to the station. You saw it work just now. Actually, I am interested in every customer's car. Very much interested. And why shouldn't I be? It means a profit for me if I can go on servicing it. I will say, Art, you work at your business. A man's got to work at anything to make it pay off. Say, last night, we mentioned the problem of getting customers to change oil when it's due. What about it? Well, I always try to have the answer. Just last week, a very good customer, Jed Cameron, thought he was buying too much oil. His car just had a lube job and an oil change. Cameron wanted to know why we recommended changing oil at frequent intervals when he had heard it wasn't necessary. I gave him the whole story. In recommending crankcase drains, Mr. Cameron, I use the same rule I follow in my own car, the one established by the car manufacturer. It provides for more frequent drains under the type of driving I do. Short runs, low speed, low motor temperatures. Most of my customers are in this bracket. I thought heat breaks down the oil. No, oil doesn't break down, but it does become contaminated with the type of driving you and I do. Unburnt gasoline dilutes the oil, and water condensation causes rusting, and sludge formation is greatly increased. You really make it sound bad. <laughs> There's more. You continually pick up dust and dirt and metal particles in the crankcase as well. They also help to contaminate the oil. I thought the oil filter took care of that. The oil filter helps, of course, but the fact still remains that most engine repairs can be traced to improper crankcase lubrication. <laughs> I can certainly do without those repairs. So you see, it's safety insurance you're buying, Mr. Cameron, when you drain the crankcase and change the oil when it's due. I feel it's my duty to help you protect your investment. That's why I recommend RPEM. No oil on the market does a better job. You sure got a lot of confidence in what you sell, Art. Yes, sir. I use RPM in my car, and I change it regularly. It's the safest and cheapest insurance for the maximum life of your car. You can either stretch the oil or the life of your car, but not both. Well, that seems to make sense, Art. I'll go along with your recommendation. And that's the story I have to tell whenever the oil change question comes up. I'm going to learn those facts. I can use that story. You can't go wrong. I mentioned last night that it all starts at the pump block, the sales room of your station. What you do there is mighty important. I don't have to tell you that. But I can tell you exactly how we handle it. Be prompt. Meet the car at the pumps if possible, always on the driver's side. Above all, smile, be friendly. Greet the customer by name if you know it. Then the big question, shall I fill the tank? If customer wants a specific amount, don't try to sell more. Offer choice of brands, unless you know what the customer uses, and in that case, simply confirm the brand. 
You know, there are things to be careful of, like keeping the hose away from the car, making metal-to-metal -metal contact between nozzle and fill spout, keeping gas cap in your hand, avoiding spills, wiping them if they occur. Make an effort to get under the hood. Most people expect this service. Check the radiator and add water if needed. Be sure to vent pressure caps before opening. Watch out for overheated engines. Keep cap in hand and hose away from the car. Be alert to sales of worn out radiator caps, radiator hose, radiator cleaner and protector. Check the oil. Regardless of oil level, if the car is due for a drain, use the mileage lead and recommend the oil change. Always suggest RPM. And remember, under the hood is your chance to check the mileage record for needed lube service. Also an opportunity to inspect the fan belt, oil filter, spark plugs. If other customers are not waiting, offer to service the battery. Use the hydrometer. Add water if needed and clean off any corrosion. Tell the customer what you've done and suggest a recharge or battery cable replacement if needed. Use clean materials and polish the windshield. Watch for worn wiper blades and arms. Clean and check the light. Suggest a replacement if necessary. Always clean the rear glass. Bring tires up to pressure. Inspect each tire for any brakes, ball spots, or other conditions which may lead to service or a new tire sale. Don't overlook the spare. Collect courteously. Itemize the sale. Mention the amount received. Count out the change and don't use greasy coins. And then a pleasant, friendly send-off with an invitation to return. You men do a good job, Art, but you can't spend that much time on every car. That's right, but we make a special effort to do the whole job just as often as possible. I found it pays off. Hey, it must be about noon. We've got an appointment to eat. Well, yeah? Sure, at the businessmen's lunch club. Come on, I'm hungry. <laughs> All right, I'll admit it, Art. I understand it better than I did last night, how you do it. But there's still one question I want the answer to. Hi there, you bowling hound. <laughs> oh, Archie, how are you? Shake hands with my friend Jack Meager. Oh, hey, Jack. Art Williams. Hi, Art. Glenn Hanlon. Jack. Then? Art and Lynn both operate Chevron gas stations. While they check your oil, I'll check your hat. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn and I have been having a little friendly discussion on station operations. And there's one question he still wants the answer to. Let's hear the question, Lynn. Well, this is it. Why should a car owner bring his car regularly into one particular station, yours, mine, or any other dealer? Well, that's a fair question, and I think you ought to get a straight answer. You might have I horned in, fellas? Of course not. We need a little help. Well, I have one answer to that question. Of course, it's only my own answer, but it may do. You certainly like to hear it. Well, I deal at one station all the time. Ronnie Lance across town. I know Ronnie. Nice guy. guy. The reason I go there is because I always get pleasant, cheerful, and competent service. Station man makes me feel as though he's glad to see me. He seems to appreciate my business and shows it by taking good care of my car. Does that kind of answer your question, Lynn? Yes, I guess it does. And I'm beginning to buy it. And I'm beginning to get hungry. Where's the food? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, you certainly get around. Around? Where? You remind me of a story. You want me to tell it to you? Oh, sure. There was this gypsy maiden. She strayed away from her tribe. And she walked right into the camp of an archaeologist. Oh, what's an archaeologist? A man who looks for mummies. What does he want them for? He doesn't find them. Well, then why don't he stop looking? There was this gypsy maiden. She wandered away from her tribe. Oh, tribe like Indians. There was this Indian maiden. Oscar, coming, Bubbles. Just skip it. Looking for mummies. He's not. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. What's the trouble, Oscar? Every place I go, I see her. That girl's haunting me. Does Bubbles know about this? Oh, that? don't say that. Don't <laughs> say that. <laughs> well, it's all in the dust. What's holding it up, Art? Our guest speaker is late. Then I'll have time to tell you what I heard this morning. This Irishman just arrived in this country. He had no place to go. But he finally finds a place to live with a Swedish family named Janssen. This Janssen was a traveling salesman.
She had a daughter, about 19, very beautiful, long blonde hair, blue eyes, and... Your attention for just a moment, please. Your pardon, gentlemen, for holding you up. I suppose everybody must be starved. I know I am. But our guest speaker, Dr. Egan, had a little battery trouble, and I suppose you all know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> However, if the young ladies will start serving, I think we'll have the doctor somewhere between the soup and the entree. <laughs> the doctor needs a dealer he can have confidence in. You're beginning to catch on, Len. Mm. Excuse me, please. How do you do it? How do you do it? Oh, I have ways. Sorry I'm late, fellas, but I've been having a time. Anything serious, doctor? My car. First, the brakes don't hold. That gets fixed. Then a wheel bearing goes off. Fixed again. I step on the starter, nothing happens. A dead battery. <laughs> you should have someone looking after your car. There's no such animal. That car is about the most expensive thing I'll ever buy outside of my home. I need it in my business. And I'd get to find anyone I can depend on to keep it in shape. I have a station man I can depend on. Is there somebody like that? Mark Williams. He's the one. He's never failed yet to keep my car running in fine shape. Yes, uh, give me his address. Sure. How'd you get here, Doctor? I had to get another battery. <laughs> this is one prescription I'm glad to take. <laughs> I can't find any service record on your car, Dr. Egan. I've never had one. You know when it was lubricated last? Haven't the faintest idea. But it doesn't matter. We're starting fresh. Do anything the car needs. And from now on, it's going to be your responsibility. And it's our job to accept the responsibility. When will it be ready? Six o'clock. I'll pick it up. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Shall I fill the tank? I'll fill it with Supreme. You two sound very formal. Well, it's a long story. I'll tell you about it on our way home. Is anything wrong? Oh, no. Everything is going to be wonderful. You sound positively cheerful. It took five gallons of Supreme. Now, if you'll release the hood, I'll see that your water and oil are safe. Oh, everything is okay under there. It's our responsibility to make sure. Right up there, sir. You must be using RPM. How did you know? But your fan belt is in bad shape. It is. Yeah. I'd recommend you put on a new one. And me with a whole rack of new ones at my station? Oh, no, I'll wait till I get home. But if anything happened to it, you know you can't drive a car very far without a fan belt. Okay, put on a new one. But the next time I come to this town, I'll be on a different team. Bowling, you mean? And that, too. <laughs> Let's go get in Chevron. <laughs> I'll have Al put a fan belt on for you. Good afternoon, Mr. Jenks. Hello, Harry. I came in to get those two new tires put on. Oh, yes, I told me you'd be in. The tires are all ready for you. Oh, good. I won't be long, Bubbles. I want to talk to Art a minute. Okay, honey. I'll have to drive the car in a little farther. Well, come on in. Excuse me. Put a new fan belt on Mr. Hanlon's 41 Pontiac, will you? Oh, Art. Hello, Lance. Hi. Hi. Hey, I don't think I told you this one. There was a traveling salesman. His line was Brazier's. Now, he gets into this strange town late one night. Excuse me, please. May I use your telephone? Certainly. Hello. Remember me? You're the girl that works at the bowling alley. Oh, no. Uh, that's my sister. Oh, I get it. You're twins. <laughs> Hello. Remember me? Then you're the girl at the bowling alley. No, that's our sister. Oh, hello. 
You know who I am. Oscar. Sure, you're Oscar. You said it, sister. 